Hey guys, how's everyone doing? Good morning and happy Wednesday to everyone. Looking at everyone's faces, everyone looks happy. Is everyone good? Give me a thumbs up if you guys can hear me okay. All right, lots of thumbs up. Now remember, we got you guys muted because if there's so many of you, if there's noise going on, I can't hear what I'm happening. So you can hear me, but I can't hear you. So you guys got to type in. And here's what we're going to do. If you remember the program, we're going to talk for about 15 minutes. And then I'm going to take your guys' questions. So I'll wait till we get to that point, and then I'll tell you, all right, let's hear the questions. And you can go ahead and tighten them in. Um, before we get started, I want to welcome everyone. I see a lot of familiar faces. A lot of you guys, welcome back. It's good to see everyone again. Hope everyone's doing well. Yeah, lots of smiles out there. Lots of thumbs up. Terrific. Well, I am Mr. Billy, Billy the Paleontologist. For those of you who I have not met, it's nice to meet you. For those who I have met, it's good to see you guys again. I run Fossil Posse Adventures, and what we do is we learn and celebrate and have fun and find adventure in the prehistoric world, particularly dinosaurs. But sometimes we talk about different things, because really everything in nature and the world and the history of the world all ties together somehow, right? So we're going to jump in in just a second. But before we get to that, I want to thank everyone who's been donating to the Museum at Dinosaur Junction. The donations have been coming in. Of course, if you want to make a donation, it's at fossilposse.com, fossilposse.com, and there's a little donation button. You can click on that. Also, all the information for our summer camps is on there. But we've been raising some money. I've been working hard the last few weeks getting the museum up and running, working on some cool stuff, working on the T-Rex skull, among other things. You guys are going to make it out here. You're going to love it. For you guys that can't make it out here, I'll probably post an online video of walking through the museum so you get to see it at some point. Also, as far as videos, remember I got the show Fossil Quest. It's probably going to start airing June 1st, and that's when you guys come out into the field with me way out into the mountains, way out into the desert, and we go looking for dinosaurs, sharks, crocodiles, all kinds of cool fossils. But that will be airing probably around June 1st, June 1st. so make sure you stay tuned for that. Okay, today, let's jump right in. Now, I know you guys are used to talking all about these guys, the big dinosaurs all the time. We're going to take a little sidetrack today, and we're going to talk about something that's equally cool in its own way, and also, without them, these guys never would have existed. And I'm talking about the world of prehistoric plants. I know some of you guys are going, plants, that's kind of boring. Not really. What if I told you that there was really poisonous and deadly plants? at one point, and there still are in some places in the world. What if I told you there was meat-eating plants? There were some of those, and there's still some of those around the world today. You never thought about that before when it came to plants, huh? There's all kinds of plants. Plants go back so far. In fact, not long ago, they found a fossil of a plant that was over 750 million years older than the dinosaurs. Whoa, yeah. Without the plants, the animals never would be here. The plants came first, and if you go even be before them, you have bacteria and things like that. But plants really established the world and allowed the natural world to grow on top of that. Because without plants, you got no plant eaters. Without plant eaters, you got no meat eaters. So it's that whole food chain thing. Now, I know a lot of you guys have a terrific collection of dinosaur books. And if I show you, I don't know if you see some of my books and magazines, when we look at pictures, of dinosaurs, you see a lot of interesting plants, but some of them look exactly like plants you've seen today, and that is absolutely true. A lot of plants haven't changed, but some of them have. Look at that weird plant right there. That looks like a giant asparagus, doesn't it? Some of them look like big chunks of broccoli, right? Prehistoric plants were really weird. Look at those right there. Those are kind of the same ones. The little dinosaur next to it to give you an idea how big they were. They were big, a lot of these plants, and they were strange for sure. We have things going back so far 
that it's hard to imagine. And some of these trees and some of these plants that were around during the dinosaur times are still around today. They're cousins. And if you remember, I would like to talk about that. Even though their cousins are around, they're not the same plants, right? And that's kind of like we talk about you and I. We have a great, 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 great grandparents somewhere back in the history, right? We're not them. We're both human, right? But there might be similarities between you and your great, 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 great grandma or grandpa, right? You might have the same smile. You may have a little mole on your face that's the same as them, but you're not the same. You're related, so you're similar, but not the same. And that's kind of like what it is with animals and plants. So a lot of the plants that were around millions and millions of years ago are not quite exactly the same, but very similar to the ones today. And I'm talking about things like cycads or cycads, some people say. That's a funny word, but they say, those are like palm trees. We see palm trees in tropical places around Florida and the Amazon jungle. So those are very similar to the ones that were around millions of years ago. Conifers. Conifer trees are basically pine trees, right? We see lots of pine trees. They're almost all over the place in different parts of the United States and all over the world. So a lot of those are the same, but little similarities make them really the same, but then there's differences in the age, of course, the differences in time in which they live. We also have ferns. A lot of you guys see ferns. A lot of you guys might have ferns at your own houses, right? We see them when we go to the, the store sometimes. You see them in, in, in different places and, and as decoration, hanging usually the ferns. Ferns look almost exactly the same today as they did millions of years ago. And a lot of the trees around then and today would have been the same trees that dinosaurs ate. In fact, there's one kind of tree called an araucaria that was around during the Jurassic period that's still around today. It's almost exactly the same. And if you go look at it in certain parts of the world, it looks the same and it's the same plant that dinosaurs ate millions of years ago. So it is pretty wild. And if we look and you're probably saying, well, how do we know about plants? Plants aren't made of bones, right? Plants don't have teeth and claws. How do we see fossils of plants? Well, just like a lot of things, they do get fossilized. Here's a bunch of photos of fossilized leaves, right? Plants, trees, different parts of them get buried and they are fossilized. In fact, if I hold this up, this is from my fossil collection. Have you guys ever heard of petrified wood, right? So this is, yeah, you guys see a lot of it goes, yeah, I've heard of that. So basically this is round, just like a branch. This is a little section of a petrified tree branch. And that is solid rock. It is fossilized. Now, I notice you're probably looking at it going, why is it so shiny? Because this one's been polished, kind of like a piece of glass. But if I hold it up close, you guys can see the rings in it. You can look at the rings in it just like a tree. When you cut a tree down, you can count the rings in a tree to see how old it is. Same with fossilized trees. Petrified wood have all the detail and the rings still in them. So that's how we know about fossilized plants. We find that. Here's one. This one, this one unfortunately broke in half, but that happens with fossils sometimes. I know a lot of you guys have awesome fossil collections, so you shouldn't get too upset when something breaks because they're super old and you can fix them. This one I just haven't fixed yet, but this is a fossil of a leaf. You can see it right there. That's a beautiful fossilized leaf. So that leaf fell out of a tree, fell into an ancient lake that had lots of sediment and mud floating in the water. And that leaf sank down the bottom of the lake and all that sediment and mud slowly buried it. And over millions of years, it turned in to this fossilized leaf right here. And that's pretty cool right there. Now, what about, you're probably asking about, well, can you know about trees and plants? What about flowers? Have you ever thought about that? Well, flowers are really, in the grand scheme of the world, are not that old. Flowers came about during the Cretaceous period. If you remember the three time periods of the dinosaurs, right? The Triassic, when they first, yeah, I see a lot of you guys going, I remember the Triassic, the Jurassic, the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the, yes, the Cretaceous, the Cretaceous, Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. The Cretaceous was the last time period like when T-Rex was around and Triceratops, right? The Jurassic had Stegosaurus and Brachiosaurus and Allosaurus. And then the Triassic, the very beginning, had the Archosaurus and Postosuchus and the weird very beginnings of dinosaurs. But if we go to the Cretaceous, right before the asteroid struck and killed almost everything on Earth, that is the time period when the very first flowers came about. 
and we find fossilized flowers. In fact, the oldest fossilized rose, you guys have seen roses, right? You know what, you wanna be careful if you stick your hand in a rose bush because it has thorns on it. Roses are beautiful. Usually they're red, but there's different colors, white, pink, yellow. They smell amazing. You see them in the stores all the time. Roses first came about during the Cretaceous period, millions of years ago. And right here in Colorado, we find some of those fossilized roses. So that's pretty cool. Flowering plants came about during the Cretaceous period. Now, here's something interesting if you think about this. What do you usually see when you see plants? You see fruit and flowers. And what might you see buzzing around plants? Bugs, right? Bugs. Plants and then bugs, two of the most amazing foundations of life on Earth since the very beginning. They have, a lot of them haven't changed. They've changed a little bit. Thankfully, the bugs have changed. So we're going to move from the plants into the bugs. And here's something really interesting about that. There's actually fossil pieces you can find out there that capture the mixing of plants and bugs. Does anyone know what that might be? If I hold this up. Does anyone recognize that? That's a piece that's called amber. And what amber is, is if, have you ever touched like a pine tree and there's that gooey sap on it and it's super sticky and it gets on your clothes and it's messy? Sap comes out of trees, it comes out of plants, lots of plants and trees ooze that sap. And it's kind of like honey coming out. Maple syrup is made from the sap of the maple tree, right? They just work on it and they make it sweet and everything. But that is like, that's like a sap coming out of that tree. When that sap dries up, kind of like if you ever take a big gooey pinch of Elmer's glue or glue that you use in school with arts and crafts, right? If you put a big blob of that on the table and come back the next day, it's going to be rock hard, right? It dries up. Well, imagine that rock hard and then getting buried for millions of years and it gets even harder and more mineralized and turns into more like stone. But the thing about amber is you can polish it up. That's why this looks shiny. And if you look right there, you see that little black dot? That is an insect. That's a bug stuck inside this piece of amber. This piece of amber is millions of years old. So that little bug stuck in there is millions of years old. So this is kind of a crossover of how we find fossils, right? We got the tree sap oozing out. You got a bug that lands on the tree and gets stuck on that amber and that sap. And then it gets buried and entombed in that. It gets encased in that amber and is in there forever and ever, pretty much. So that's kind of a crossover, which is kind of cool. But let's get into the bugs now. We kind of talked about the plants. Plants are really strange, right? And then we get into the bugs, which are even stranger. When you get into the bugs of the prehistoric world, there, of course, there is definitely things like flies and mosquitoes and spiders and cockroaches, for sure. And a lot of those have not changed at all. But I got a few pictures here to show you guys because I don't have fossils of a lot of these because they're really rare. Now, for those of you guys who get creeped out real quickly, you might want to look away at this one. But look at that. There's a fossil of a giant spider right there. And you're probably wondering, well, what were spiders like during the dinosaur times, right? Well, they probably looked very similar to spiders we see today, all different kinds, right? From little spiders you might see in your house in the corner of the room, right on up to big tarantulas. Some of them are super creepy and scary. And some of them are really big, but maybe not that dangerous, kind of like today. A lot of today, a lot of the biggest spiders that live in the world aren't really that dangerous. They're just super scary because they're big. But the spiders during this time were the same. There was little ones and there was big ones. And the biggest ones they found so far were probably about as wide as a basketball or maybe a little bit wider than your head. So they were pretty big which is pretty creepy. And they were walking around. Spiders have been around a long, long time. Now, one of the bugs in the prehistoric world that a lot of people who know anything about the prehistoric world know about is one called Arthropleura. Arthropleura, yikes. Just the name is kind of scary, right? Well, here's the thing about Arthropleura. Besides being really relieved it's not around anymore, it's one of my favorite insects. And you guys know what a millipede is? You know what a millipede is, right? It's one of those long, skinny bugs, and it looks, it looks like it has a thousand legs on it, right? It's kind of like that, only Arthropleura was way bigger. Here's a picture of how big Arthropleura was. That's a model. That's a model that some scientists put together. 
He was about nine to 11 feet long, three to four feet wide. And he was a pretty tough insect. When he got angry, he could rear up about halfway. Look, at there's Nigel right there. Nigel is one of the best TV hosts and naturalist guys. Nigel Marvin right there. And this is from a TV show he did. So that's not real. That's a computer generation of how big Arthropleura would have been. Look at how big it is right next to Nigel. That's crazy, right? And you're probably wondering, well, how do they know it was that big? Well, you remember, it all comes down to fossils. And what do I like to say most about fossils? Do you guys remember? Fossils never lie. Exactly. Fossils never lie. Fossils always tell us the absolute truth of what the prehistoric world was like. There's a fossilized piece of Arthropleura right there to give an idea of what it looked like. He had a sectioned body, just like millipedes do, only he was way bigger. So the fossils teach us about what these insects were like. And do you guys remember what makes insects really unique? If I were to say the word invertebrate, do you remember what that means? And what vertebrate means? I see a lot of people going like this. Awesome. For those of you who aren't sure, here's the difference. And once you learn this, you'll never forget this. A vertebrate animal, a vertebrate, means it has vertebra. And vertebra are the bones that stack up to make our back. If you reach back and touch your backbone, you feel those little knobs and bumps back there? Those are all those vertebra that stack up so you can sit upright. Because without a, without a spine, you're just like a piece of jelly, right? So that's what makes us vertebrate. And invertebrate are animals that don't have those. They don't have spines, they don't have vertebra. So things like jellyfish and starfish and insects, right? They're all invertebrate. They don't have skeletons, really. If anything, insects wear their skeletons on the outside. Us, our skeletons are on the inside, our skulls, our arm bones, and then we have muscle and skin on top of that. Insects have their skeleton on the outside, and all the gooey stuff's on the inside, which is why you step on a cockroach or something, it goes crunch and goes right? That's kind of gross, but that's the way that is. Invertebrate, no spine, vertebrate spine, right? So insects are invertebrate. And there's another one I want to show you that was, there's a couple more I want to show you. One called, uh, who is it called? Pentacopterus. Pentacopterus was actually kind of like a crustacean, which is like a crab. He lived in the ocean, but he was a type of animal called a sea scorpion. We know what scorpions are. They're kind of nasty insects. This is, a, again, this is made up model to show you how big it was. They're not around anymore. There it is, right? There's Pentacopterus right there. Look at the size of that sea scorpion right there, right? That is a giant thing. I'm really glad those are gone. I would not want to see that in the ocean, right? I'm glad that lived during the dinosaur times. And there's one other one that's really famous. In fact, here's the fossil of that, that one I just showed you, the sea scorpion. That's what a fossil looked like. If I can get it right, there it is, right? You see the fossil right there? That's what it looked like. And the fossils never lie. So if we find a fossil of a giant insect, well, that insect was alive at one time, and that's what it looked like pretty much. If we go to other, this other one, this is one you guys might know. If, you, if, I ever heard, if you ever hear me say the name Meganeuropsis, does that sound familiar? Yeah? I see you guys know these. What about if I told you dragonfly? You know what a dragonfly looks like, right? Dragonflies are really cool. They're about that wide, and they're usually flying around ponds and creeks. And they're all different colors, right? Well, during the di during actually this was before the dinosaur times. There was one dragonfly called Meganeuropsis, and that's how big it was. Look at the size of that dragonfly! Oh my God! Now the good thing is, is it probably wouldn't hurt you because dragonflies don't really hurt people. They don't sting or anything like that. But you'd hear them coming from a long ways. It probably sound like a helicopter flying through the air. And for those of you out there wondering about mosquitoes. What were mosquitoes like during the dinosaur times? Well, we find a lot of mosquitoes in amber, right? A lot of those little bugs, but there was bigger ones because we find fossilized ones. Here's kind of an idea of maybe there's a few insects out there if I can get that just right. Look at the size of that mosquito in that guy's hand. Wow, that's one serious uh, can of uh, off right there. That's one bug sp giant can of bug spray you need to get that thing out of you. So here's the thing. I just showed you some super wild, amazing examples of some gigantic bugs that used to live in the prehistoric times. 
but not all of them were like that. A lot of the bugs that lived during that time are the same as bugs that live today. Cockroaches, I mentioned before, cockroaches haven't changed in hundreds of millions of years. Even their size is pretty much the same. They, don't, they haven't found any giant cockroach fossils, so they haven't changed a whole lot. Flies, mosquitoes, even ticks. We gotta be careful about ticks, right? When you're out hiking, ticks were around during the dinosaur time. Dinosaurs would have had to deal with ticks and, and bugs and blood sucking mosquitoes and all kinds of stuff, but they're incredible. And you guys can read so much more about not just crazy prehistoric plants, but all the bugs. So make sure you get some books. There's some wonderful books. I know you guys got birthdays coming up. There's always Christmas and Hanukkah, right? So make sure you ask for books about prehistoric stuff. And so that's kind of an overview of bugs and plants during the prehistoric time. I know that was real kind of a light thing, but I don't wanna give you too much to think about. So now, I think it's time for some questions. So what do you guys got out there? Let's see if we can figure this out. What do you got, Lily? So, uh, ben Holt. Ben, hey Ben, how are you, buddy? Ben Holt, what do you got? We've got lots of questions. Lots of questions, all right. The first one is, did dinosaurs find and see fossils? Did dinosaurs find and see fossils? That's a really neat, neat question. And I would guess yes, and here's why. When we see a fossil, Let's say, for example, we see a fossil of Tyrannosaurus rex. Well, that Tyrannosaurus rex died about 68 million years ago, right? And it took all that time to fossilize, and maybe the hillside eroded, and there's his skull sitting right there. Well, if you were Tyrannosaurus rex, 68 million years before you was kind of animals like Allosaurus and Stegosaurus. So I bet there was times when they came across them in a hillside or maybe in a creek bed or they had fallen out of the dirt, something like that. But here's the difference. They didn't probably know what they were. Likely, they didn't know what they were. I think animals nowadays, like if you go for a walk with your dog and it finds a deer skeleton, it doesn't know it's a deer necessarily. It smells it because it knows it's something like that, but it's not sure. Who knows if dinosaurs knew what those fossils were, but as far as the time it takes to create a fossil, Absolutely, there would have been fossils lying around while there was living dinosaurs walking around. So that's a pretty cool question. Good one, Ben. What's the next one? Dylan asked, what was the first plant even when the dinosaurs were around? What was the first plant even when the dinosaurs were around? Well, there was a type of seaweed that was discovered, but this is way before the dinosaurs. Remember, when the dinosaurs came about, there was lots of different plants. Plants are one of the first things to inhabit an area before the wildlife moves in. If you ever seen an area where there was a bush fire or a wildfire and the forest burned down, the first thing to come back is grasses and weeds. The plants come back first. So even when the very first dinosaurs were walking around, there was already lots of different plants. But the first kind of plant, recognizable plant, was a type of seaweed that lived almost a billion years ago. That's about 750 million years before the dinosaurs. Whoa, that's crazy. So there's some pretty old ones. Yeah, so that's probably the oldest is that type of seaweed right there. Yeah, good question. Ollie asks, what's the tallest prehistoric plant and the biggest bug? The tallest pre Ollie, good question. What's the tallest prehistoric plant and the biggest prehistoric bug? I would say the tallest prehistoric plant is probably a type of conifer tree. Those are pine trees. Those are the same trees that the family of the giant redwoods that live today are in. And there's definitely fossilized remains from huge pine trees from way back in prehistoric times. In the town of Florissant, Colorado, they find enormous tree trunks, like nine or 10 feet wide tree trunks where the tree got broken off and it's just the tree trunk all fossilized. So there was definitely some enormous trees and I would guess that those would be pine trees of some kind. As far as the bugs, I think the one I showed you, Arthropleura, was probably the biggest one so far. We'll take one more look at Arthropleura so you remember how gigantic he was. Nine to 11 feet long, three to four feet wide. That millipede was, or centipede was big enough to eat us, no problem. And that's pretty scary. So I would say Arthropleura is probably the biggest prehistoric insect so far discovered. And that's why I always like to um, like enunciate on so far. That's what's so cool about science and the natural world and fossils is just because we haven't found anything bigger yet doesn't mean there wasn't one bigger. There could still be one out there. We just haven't found it yet. And that's why people like me like to go out and look for fossils all the time because there's more to find. So, all right, next question. Stella asked, is the strongest prehistoric tree as strong as the modern strongest Mm, Stella, terrific question. Is the strongest prehistoric tree as strong as the most modern living tree now? 
I would guess yes, because I think the trees made now, made of pulp and the, and the whatever trees are made out of, the wood basically that they grow, is the same as it was during that time. So I would guess when I just mentioned those giant pine trees, I would guess that those giant pine trees were probably just as strong as the pine trees of today. And actually, here's something interesting. You know about the giant redwood trees that live today in California, right? The biggest trees on planet Earth. They're so big, you could drive a car through them. They're so big, it would take more than 30 people holding hands to encircle one tree. That's how big these trees are. But the thing about giant redwoods is they are gigantic, right? But they're very fragile. They're very fragile. In fact, that's one of the reasons they stopped uh, uh, thinking, like cutting them down, right? They stopped cutting them down to use them because every time one fell down, it was fragile and just shattered like a piece of glass. So even though they're the biggest, they're kind of fragile, even though they, and they live like three or 4,000 years. Imagine a tree 3,000 years old. So great question, Stella. I think the trees then and the trees now are probably similar in strength. Yeah, great question. All right, next one. Okay, back to Ben. Ben. Were Mesozoic dinosaurs invertebrates? The answer to that is no, they were not. Because remember, invertebrates are animals that don't have skeletons. They don't have vertebra, and the vertebra are what makes our spine. Even an alligator, because an alligator walks on all fours, right? It still has a spine. It just walks down like this, whereas we walk up on two feet, we have a spine. So anything that's vertebrate has a spine, it has backbones. And all dinosaurs and all reptiles, right? Fish, sharks, all those things have skeletons, they have vertebra. So that makes them vertebrate, absolutely. So invertebrate stuff is things that don't have skeletons, bugs, jellyfish, starfish, things like that. So great question, Ben. So no, dinosaurs would have been vertebrates, just like you. Yep. And then also from Ben, what was the first bug and did mosquitoes drink blood back then? Oh, Ben, good one. What was the first bug and did mosquitoes drink blood? The second part of that, yes mosquitoes did drink blood. And I think there would have been a lot of dinosaurs at certain times would have had a really difficult time because there was probably certain places in the world and times where the bugs were really, really bad. And dinosaurs couldn't swat them away, especially something like a Brachiosaurus, right? And they would have been swarmed with bugs. There's places in Alaska right now where the bugs can drive animals like reindeer and caribou can drive them crazy because the bugs are so bad. There's been instances of caribou, they're kind of like a big deer, getting so crazy with bugs flying around them that they run into lakes and go underwater just to get away from the bugs. So I think during the dinosaur times, the bugs would have been really terrible. As I mentioned, ticks would have been a big issue for dinosaurs because they couldn't get them off, especially if they're on their backs. So ticks and mosquitoes were definitely blood-sucking things that would have been around for sure. As far as the first insect, I do not know the answer to that. You might have to find that answer and let me know. I know that, that things like cockroaches and, and mosquitoes, um, ticks, things like that, those really primitive basic insta uh, insects go way back. They're some of the first ones. But as far as the very first, I'm not sure what that is. So we may have to look into that. If you find out, email me and let me know because I'd like to know the answer for that one. All right. So Cormac and Henry had very similar questions okay. on what you were talking about. How did the dinosaurs deal with the mosquitoes and how did the dinosaurs defend themselves from the bugs? Cormac and Henry both had similar questions. To how, did, how did dinosaurs deal with basically blood-sucking insects? There wasn't you know, much they could do. I would guess, I mean, this is totally guessing because we don't have any film or video of how dinosaurs dealt with it, but probably very similar to animals today. If you look at horses when they're standing in a stall and there's flies flying around, what do they do? They blink their eyes a lot, right, to keep the flies out of their eyes. They also they have big, long, hairy tails, and they swoosh their tails around to kind of make the bugs go away as best they can. Same with their manes. If you ever see a horse shake his head, all that hair on his neck, his mane, all that hair goes like this and kind of shoes all the bugs away. He's got to do it a lot. Now, dinosaurs probably didn't have hair like that, so they may have done something else. They might have just been able to wiggle, or maybe they would walk through, brush, through uh, bushes and plants to try and scrape off the bugs. It would have been, it's kind of the more you think about it, almost the more it makes you kind of crazy imagining so many bugs flying around. And if you didn't have hands to get rid of them, what did you do? T-Rex definitely couldn't do anything, right? He couldn't even reach his face, so he couldn't swap the bugs. That's a great question. I'm not sure. They would do whatever they could probably if the bugs were really bad, especially around their eyes, because bugs can like lay, uh, lay eggs in and around eyes, and that's really scary when it comes to that sometimes. So who knows what they did? 
Maybe they went in the water. Yep. So the Brown family. Oh, hi, Brown family in Texas. They want to know where ants around during the dinosaur age. Were ants around? Ants, I believe, came later on. I think they came in the Cretaceous or towards the end of the Cretaceous period. That's a terrific question. Ants are amazing creatures. Uh, I don't know if you know this statistic. Maybe you don't, but of all the animals on planet Earth, ants make up about 80%, something like that, of all animals, everything, not just bugs, but all animals. And of that chunk of insects, plants, or excuse me, ants still make up about 96%. Because one ant hill can have a million ants or 500,000 ants, and ants work together. It's like all those millions or thousands of ants in one anthill make, make up one organism, which is kind of crazy. It's kind of like a robot. You have a big robot, and one ant, every ant is a piece of that robot, and the whole thing together makes a robot, but by themselves, they don't really do much. So they all have to work together to create this whole ant colony. I think ants came in the late Cretaceous. They don't go back that far. They're pretty amazing and very highly intellectual or have a lot of intellect. They're pretty smart creatures. It's amazing what ants can can achieve. So great question, Brown family. Ants, really neat. All right, next question. Kaysen asked, what was the first dinosaur? Hi, Kaysen. Good to hear from you. Uh, the first dinosaur is always a tough question. Now, they have found some dinosaurs like Eoraptor going way back in the Triassic about 230 million years ago, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the very first dinosaur. It's hard to tell which one was the exact very first one, because remember, over millions of years, it started with a creature called archosaurs. An archosaur was kind of a reptilian, kind of weird creature, and those branched off. One direction turned into crocodiles, and one direction turned into dinosaurs. And of course, we know on the dinosaur side, that broke off and went all different directions with all different dinosaurs, but they all originated from the archosaurs. So it's hard to tell which one was first. I know, I think Stelophysis and Eoraptors were some of the very first fossilized dinosaurs like that found. So good, great question, Casey. All right, what do you got next? Fine. I'd like to know if Stegosaurus or Allosaurus ever saw flowers. She heard that flowers didn't exist mm. yet when they were walking around. Ida, terrific question. Did Allosaurus or Stegosaurus ever see flowers? You were paying attention, right? Because Allosaurus and Stegosaurus lived during the Jurassic period. You're right. The Triassic, the Jurassic, the Cretaceous. Allosaurus and Stegosaurus were in the Jurassic, but flowers didn't come around until the Cretaceous. So did, Del did Allosaurus and Stegosaurus see flowers? Probably not as far as fossils we found so far, but, but who's to say we just haven't found any fossils of flowers from the Jurassic? So we don't know for sure, but as far as the fossils we have now, the knowledge we have now about fossilized flowers, the time would tell us that the fossil flowers, or those flowers weren't around when Stegosaurus and Allosaurus were around. So as of right now, with the information we have to science, those guys did not see flowers, unless we just haven't found them yet, but you never know, which is so exciting about science. Great question, Ida, really imaginative, terrific question. All right, next one. Uh, Colette asks, did flowers have petals in prehistoric times? Hi, Colette. Colette, New York, I gotta say, Colette sent me an amazing video. When, uh, when her internet was down, she missed the last show, so she made her own Fossil Posse Adventures show, and it was terrific, Colette, so thank you for sending it. I loved it, I loved it. Um, did fossilized flowers have petals? Yes, they did, because that's what pretty much made them different from other stuff. Petals on flowers made them different than like pine cones, or um, uh, little nubs of things that grew into nuts or something like that. So fossilized flowers, flowers during the Cretaceous time, they did have petals, because that's what makes them flowers. Great, another great question. You guys come up with, with the best, really creative, imaginative stuff. I, that's kind of why we do this, to get you guys thinking about really unique and cool stuff. All right, how much time we have, by the way? Do you know? uh, we have five minutes. Five minutes, all right. And I have a bunch more questions. Bunch more questions, uh, lay them on me. Format asked, what was the biggest bird during the Triassic? Cormac, what was the biggest bird during the Triassic period? Birds weren't around yet. Birds don't show up until in late during the Jurassic period. During the Triassic times, the only flying things then were insects, like mosquitoes and things like that, right? Flies, and the pterosaurs, pterodactyl type creatures, the pterosaurs, flying reptiles. Those guys originated during the Triassic, but there were no birds yet. 
They would come way later in the Jurassic and into the Cretaceous. And even then, they probably didn't get much bigger than an eagle of today. But later on, into the Ice Age, we had birds like an eagle that was so big it could carry away a person. It had a wingspan of almost 20 feet. It looked exactly like an eagle of today, but it was, had a 20-foot wingspan. It could carry a person away. But that came during the Ice Age, way, way after the dinosaurs. So there's your answer to that. No birds in the Triassic yet. Dylan asks, what's the strongest bug? Dylan asks, what's the strongest bug? Well, there's some big bugs. Like today, we have rhinoceros beetle among them. Among others, rhinoceros beetle is a beetle that gets about this big. And it's pretty strong but for the size of a bug. But pound for pound, ants. Remember we were just talking about ants? Pound for pound, which means, when I say pound for pound, it means even though an ant is pretty tiny, if you take into consideration how little he is and how strong he is, his amount of strength is more than anything else. Ants can carry pieces of food that would be the equivalent of you guys walking over to your kitchen or dining room table or a piano in your house or a lawnmower and reaching out with one hand and just picking it up with one hand. Imagine if you were that strong, right? That's about how strong ants are. Even though they're tiny, they have that amount of strength compared to their body size. So when you see an ant on the ground carrying like a piece of food, like a breadcrumb or something like that, that's like you guys carrying an enormous heavy load of something. So ants are super strong. All right, we got another one? Stella asks, how many bug fossils have you found? Stella, how many bug fossils have I found? I've actually never found a bug fossil. I haven't found any yet, to my knowledge. I have a few in my collection, but they're not here. They're in the museum at Dinosaur Junction. So you gotta come check it out. I haven't found any, but there's millions and millions of them out there and millions more to be found, Stella. Great question. One more final question. Cormac asks, how many different dinosaurs are there? Cormac asks, how many different dinosaurs are there? So far, scientists have discovered about 700 different kinds of dinosaurs. That's in the last 150 years all over the world, about 700. And most scientists will agree that they think there's probably another 700 dinosaurs that just haven't been discovered yet, which again makes science so cool because there's so much out there for you guys to go discover. Oh, we got one more? Squeeze in one more question? All right, one more. What are we doing on Friday? What are we doing on Friday? I'm not sure. I think we might have to do a whole show about Stegosaurus. Or T-Rex. Or T-Rex. I tell you, well, why don't you guys message me at fossilposse.com and we'll take a vote. I want, do we do a show on Stegosaurus or do we do a show on T-Rex? One or the other. So you guys make the decision. You guys, thank you so much for tuning in today. And we'll get back to all the stuff with tea on Friday or big stuff on Friday. But thank you so much. Be good to your parents. We're living weird times, but I know you guys are doing great. So keep up the good work and we'll talk to you soon. Take care.